Uh, my program today is on chemical safety, uh, which is the mandatory uh, program for recertification and certification of consulting Rosarians. Our question today, I like to phrase it in a Shakespearean way, is to spray or not to spray. That is the question, whether it is nobler and roses to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous insects or to take arms against a sea of pestilence and by opposing end them. And that is, in fact, a question that is asked by many people. We had our roses and review survey, and it was very interesting where we asked the typical question, do you regularly spray or not? And uh, we learned that about half the people who responded to the Roses and Review do not, whereas the other half do. And that's the question of whether or not this is something that, uh, I mean, you'll get this question as a consulting Rosarian about whether or not I should spray. And the purpose of spraying and controlling pests and diseases of roses uh, it's very simple. It's to protect the blooms and the foliage necessary to support the production of beautiful roses. Um, I grow roses because I like the blooms. And uh, the foliage is important in order to produce the blooms. Uh, to go into the details of photosynthesis and so on, but my mentor in roses said years ago, that uh, you grow good foliage and God will put blooms on top. And he wasn't particularly a religious man, but that's an accurate uh, statement in my view, and that if you grow good foliage, uh, it will support the blooms and will wind up with beautiful blooms. As a beginning place, uh, we talk about uh, integrated pest management. And first of all, I want to point out here, there's a little check mark or, uh, that you'll see from time to time in my outline. Uh, the purpose of the check mark is to draw attention to those of you who may be contemplating taking some form of a test in the near future uh, should pay close attention to the uh, items that are check marked uh, because they may very well appear on that test. And one of them is uh, integrated pest management. I'm not really a great fan of this term. You know, I remember when I first heard about integrated pest management and my response was, I don't want to manage my pests, I want them dead. Uh, but that's, you know, it's a well-established term. And uh, you, I got a picture here of Baldo, uh, my good friend, who was a great proponent of pest management. You can see him managing a pest uh, on, uh, on the photograph. Uh, it's a program of monitoring and controlling insects and disease based on observation coupled with a combination of control methods is needed that are least disruptive to the environment, which is some fancy words to describe basically what I would call some common sense pest control. Uh, what we do in integrated pest management is to uh, monitor, is to come to understand what pests uh, attack roses, uh, what the conditions are for which uh, promote those pests, uh, and then uh, a decision needs to be made and the decision that is to be made is, is how much you're going to take uh do you want uh, uh what do you tolerate in terms of damage that might be uh, inflicted by pests and some will tolerate a lot so some just don't want to spend the time uh addressing that problem uh, others uh, like me i'm an exhibitor and i i don't tolerate very much in terms of monitoring and uh, of pests and disease for my roses uh, as a consulting Rosarian, you know, our job is to advise and we provide, uh, we consult with people. And so uh, instead of telling people how to do things, uh, you know, the first thing we need to find out whenever you're talking to somebody as a consulting Rosarian is what is it that they want to accomplish? What is their tolerance level, for example, of insects and disease? Uh, do they want to, uh, you know, are they, they, they want to maintain a no spray garden. Uh, do they you know, have little tolerance like I do? Uh, you know, I think our job is to, is to answer questions. And the first thing we have to do is ask questions to find out what it is that people are willing to, to deal with. And then we can give some basic common sense advice. Uh, here's a couple of pieces of advice, most, both of which have check marks. One is that uh, generally uh, we use an insecticide only when the damage becomes intolerable. And then when we do so, we want to use the least toxic and effective 
insecticides. They're the least toxic and effective, not the least effective. Uh, we want to keep fungal diseases under control, generally uh, by preventing them. You know, we uh, have a separate program that you'll see on pests and diseases, which will uh, help identify the diseases that we're dealing with. But the really important thing to understand is the circumstances, the environmental conditions that uh, will produce, uh, you know, which will favor the development of the, the pest. You know, being able to identify a problem after it's already occurred is you know, less important uh, than figuring out what the environmental conditions are that might bring that problem on and preventing it. I mean, for example, powdery mildew, most of us are familiar with powdery mildew, and you see that white fungus on the on the rose itself. By the time it gets there and you see that, you've got the problem. You've got a big problem. And it's better to understand what conditions favor the development of powdery mildew and to advise people about that so as to prevent it rather than uh, being able to identify it when it comes along. Here's uh, some non-chemical approaches to, uh, here's Baldo's managing pests. I uh, borrowed these from his slide and his program that I've enjoyed over the years. Uh, but let's talk about chemicals. You know, I have people who will say, well, I, I don't want to spray chemicals in my garden. I don't want, uh, you know, I, I don't want chemical solutions. Well, the point is, is that everything's a chemical. I mean, some things are simple, single chemicals, water, for example. Water's a chemical. It's H2O, two H's and an O. Uh, so, you know, just to start talking about chemicals as if chemicals are bad, uh, we need to go a little further and talk about what we're talking about, which is a pesticide. What's a pesticide? Under federal law, any chemical that's intended for preventing or destroying a pest is considered to be a pesticide. And the term pest includes everything that you can imagine, such as insects, mites, fungus diseases that affect roses. The term side is from the Latin, which means it's a substance or action that kills. And so that's what the intention of a pesticide is. You know, for all the following are pesticides or insecticides, which kill insects, fungicides, which kill fungus, and miticides, which uh, kill mite, mites, spider mites, uh, also called a mycaricide. Uh, and then, of course, a homicide. Well, that's investigated by the police. In terms of sides, killing, a really important point to understand in dealing with chemicals is that it is the dose that makes the poison. Just because a chemical is present does not mean that it is harmful in the amount that is present. I mean, here's some examples of some common uh, food project, food. Uh, apple, for example, has a chemical that is, uh, is toxic, and so do pears and potatoes and zucchini. So we need to understand throughout that it is the dose that makes the poison. And the dose, we're talking about the toxicity of the uh, pesticide. Uh, just because something is natural, I have, you know, there's a widely held belief that, you know, something that's natural and organic is, is not toxic. And yet the truth is, is you some of the most toxic chemicals that we can come up with are in fact quite natural. I mean, here is, uh, many of us will remember back in the dark ages, as it were, the uh, nicotine sulfate. I mean, this stuff is poison. It's a danger label. Uh, it's, you know, it's just about one of the most toxic things you can tell. And I love this, this advertisement that I found uh, in one of the old American Rose uh, annuals. You know, daisies won't tell. Uh, you know, the reason that daisies won't tell about with nicotine sulfate is because people who used it were pushing up the daisies. I mean, this stuff is, uh, but it's perfectly natural. It comes from tobacco plants. Notice the name of the company here, Tobacco Byproducts and Chemical. So toxicity is a matter of perspective. Uh, I have read somewhere that cows kill four times as many people in the U.S. each year as sharks. Um, I'm not sure how relevant that is. But anyway, the important thing here is that it is, the pesticide labels will come with a signal word. And the signal word will indicate the toxicity of the product. The signal words start with, Danger. Danger is category one. It means it's highly toxic. And if it then has a skull and crossbones and says poison, that is as toxic as it gets. And then 
If it does not have the skull and crossbones, it is typically because the product has some type of eye or skin irritation that is very dangerous. For example, here is Dacanil Ultrax, which has a danger label on it. And the reason is because it causes irreversible eye damage. The intermediate label warning is category two, which is warning. A warning is typically something that is, can cause uh, more temporary harm, but nevertheless significant harm. Uh, for example, Honor Guard, which is uh, uh, propiconazole, uh, causes substantial but very temporary uh, eye injury. So uh, it's also harmful if swallowed, inhaled, or absorbed through the skin. And then the least cautious or least uh, toxic of the uh, labels that we have is caution. Uh, theoretically, there's two caution labels, three and four, but I've never actually seen uh, that broken out on a chemical label, and I'm not even sure that's true anymore, but the word caution on a pesticide label means that the chemical is among the least uh, toxic pesticides. Uh, neem oil, for example, is considered among the least toxic by oral ingestion. Another measure of toxicity we run into with chemicals is called LD50. An LD50, the LD means lethal dose, and 50 uh, is a percentage of the population. Basically, an LD50 uh, dose, uh, what LD50 is, is the, an amount that is necessary to kill 50% of a population of rats. Uh, and there's different types of LD50s. It depends also on how you want to kill them, whether or not it's by ingestion or by dermal contact or whatever. Uh, mostly the LD50s that you'll see are ingestion, which is basically how much of something you need to eat in order to uh, to kill it. And uh, here, here for example, is a breakdown of the LD50s that uh, a lot of things that we deal with in roses. Uh, you'll see, for example, uh, here is cyanide. <laughs> well, we don't really deal with that in roses. Ten. The lower the number, the more toxic it is, because the question here is, how much of this you got to give to a rat to kill it? And so cyanide is right here at 10. But you can see that uh, here's, here's something rotenone, for example, which is considered by many to be organic. It's 132. Nicotine sulfate, which I've commented on, is up at 50, 60. But look at uh, you know something like malathion, which is up at 1,000, or baking soda here. And for those of you, uh, well, I've got my can of Dr. Pepper here, which has 41.3 milligrams of caffeine in it. And that, once again, illustrates the issue that the point that the dose is what makes the poison. Uh, nevertheless, caffeine, uh, you, you can kill rats with it. Here's a concept which uh, is useful to come across. You'll find a label on many pesticides called OMRI, the OMRI label. That means the Organic Materials Research Institute, and that's an international nonprofit organization that determines which products are allowed for use in organic production and processing. So generally speaking, an OMRI designation is a good indicator that a product is less toxic and has less environmental impact. As we will see, however, that is not a perfect circumstance because uh, I have done a good deal of research and work on what I call the environmental impact quotient. Actually, I don't call it. Uh, Cornell University pioneered this back in the early 1990s. And they basically calculated a total environmental impact of a pesticide, including toxicity to wildlife and humans, as well as aquatic and soil effects. And they came up with a number from 10 to 100. The higher number, the greater the negative environmental impact. You can pull these up online uh, if you're interested in them, but we also uh, have submitted as a handout my article on a subject, which I wrote four years ago, so uh, or updated then, so it's becoming a little bit out of date, but nevertheless, uh, it's, it's still, I think, useful. And what the environmental impact quotient people say, you know, you need to adjust it for the field rating. In other words, if you're going to once again, we're back to the concept of the dose is what makes the poison. So the fact that a uh, product may not be that uh, effective, you know, may, may not be impact the environment that much, uh, if you have to use a lot of it, uh, you get more impact on the, on the uh, 
environment. So what I did in this is I adjusted this and produced a number of tables that are in the article and the handout that you have. And here, for example, uh, the, the rosy IQ is what I call this, uh, ratings of uh, a number of common uh, insecticides. Right here, as it, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but this is neem, pyrethrum, spinosad. You see, these all have OMRI label, labels, so then they're very low in terms of their impact. Uh, ironically, here, the two highest also have OMRI labels, which are petroleum oil and potassium soap. And the reason for that is because you have to use a lot of it in order for it to be effective. And so once you use that amount, you have a higher environmental impact. And so what that table shows are products like neem or the pyrethrums, the spinosad, the cyphlothrin. These are all fairly low, and whereas the highest impacts are something like, even though if you notice that had a high LD50, uh, nevertheless, it has a significantly high rose uh, environmental impact. Fungicides, uh, here we run into the same uh, thing. Here's compass, which is the, the strabiliorans. Uh, Serenade's a newer uh, biofungicide, uh, which is generally regarded as organic. It may, I haven't checked lately, but it may now have an OMRI label because it was shooting to get one. Uh, yet again, here are some of the organic products here down at the bottom. They, I mean, this is off the charts. This is Bordeaux mixture, copper sulfate and lime, which has been around since the Middle Ages and is incredibly damaging to the environment. So we see here the lowest environmental impact with compost, serenade, and so on. And the highest, uh, you see, here's that Dacanil Ultrax, which also has a danger label on it. And it's also very, uh, has a high impact on the environment. Uh, the miticides, you'll see a very low rose IQ on the main ones like Floramite and Avid and Tetracyan. Whereas uh, Vendex has been off the market, Calthane has been off the market for several years and because undoubtedly they got these warning and danger labels and have a high environmental impact. There again is a summary of, of those. I also did some research and uh, we included as one of the handouts, uh, I call this another EIQ, which is the economic impact quotient. You know, which asks the question on a per application rate, what does it cost to use some of these uh, pesticides? And, uh, you know, this is a very revealing chart. I invite you to take a look at your handout and look at it uh, and, and see uh, the, the relative cost per application uh, per gallon of mixture. And, you know, this is a couple of years out of date now, but it's accurate in terms of describing the relations. I mean, for example, you will find if you look at it that you you want to buy conserve, which is uh, the spinosa. Uh, you know, and that's conserve is expensive. It comes in this bottle like this, and it's very very expensive. People say, "Oh my goodness, I don't want to buy that." And they, you can go out to your local nursery and buy Captain Jack's dead bug brew, which uh, costs 17 times the cost of conserve for the exact same active ingredient. Uh, so. One thing that this chart will show you is that the things that you buy at the local nursery are a heck of a lot more expensive. Uh, and that's primarily because uh, they're usually much less concentrated and, and uh, basically you're buying water. Uh, you will also find that uh, uh, the products that, uh, you know, the, the, with the warning labels and so on uh, tend to be cheaper. And I think once again, that's because uh, they, water down products in order to uh, get them into a caution label. Now I've mentioned the label. The label is all important. The label is really key. Uh, the label is, and then, you know, every chemical is going to come with, a pesticide is going to come with a label on it. And in fact, uh, if you order it online, uh, every, you, know, you can get directly from the manufacturer or from wherever you're ordering it to click on to get the label, to look at the label. And in fact, uh, I give a link there to cdms.net as a label database and has the labels and the MSDS is for all registered pesticides. Uh, it's important that you read the label. Well, uh, we teach everybody to read the label, but I doubt that there's anybody here and I read labels uh, who's ever read a label from beginning to end. Uh, this is my 
dear friend uh, who's passed away, uh, Kent Campbell, reading a label. Uh, I have spent some time, lots of time, reading labels. And what is, I like to focus on is to find out the most important things, such as the product name, its active ingredients, its toxicity, the safety information that's applicable, use restrictions, and so on. And most importantly, the application rate. Now, it is a violation of federal law to use any pesticide in a manner inconsistent with its labeling. You will find that warning on every pesticide label. And in fact, a label is required for every pesticide registered in the U.S. And it is the main source of information. It is the source of information. It is the recommendation. And there's a widely held belief among consulting Rosarians that we're not supposed to recommend any chemical. Uh, that's not true. What we're not supposed to do, what we're supposed to do is not make any recommendation for the use of a pesticide that is inconsistent with the label. But if it's on the label, you can tell people what's on the label, uh, particularly since it's often very difficult to find what's on the label because the label's in such fine print. Now, what does it mean to be inconsistent? Is a violation of federal law to use a product in a manner inconsistent with its label. For example, uh, I've heard many times exhibitors will suggest that you uh, missed your blooms prior to a rose show at one half strength insecticide. Is using an insecticide at half the strength recommended by the label an inconsistent use? Or let's suppose that uh, you've got a problem like we have in California where the chili thrips have arrived in California. And so we want to spray something to kill chili thrips. And I've got an insecticide. And the insecticide says that it kills thrips, but it doesn't have the word chili thrips on it. Can I spray that insecticide on roses uh, when my secret intention is I'm going to try to kill chili thrips instead of just thrips? And the answer to that question is actually in the statute itself, in the law. And here's two elements of the law that are directly in the statute, one of which says that the application of a pesticide at a dosage, concentration, or frequency less than that specified on the label is not a usage inconsistent with the labeling, unless the label specifically prohibits it, which and I've yet to see a label that specifically prohibits using it at less than what they recommend. Now, less may very well be and probably will be less effective, but that doesn't mean it's more dangerous to use less, and that's why you can use less. And if roses are on the label or ornamental flowers or something that, you know, if you can use it to spray uh, for roses, the fact that, you know, you're spraying for chili thrips as opposed to flower thrips, and chili thrips not on the label, that's not a use inconsistent with the label. So, you know, then you really think about those are pretty obvious. You know, they should be obvious. You know, how is it we're trying to protect the environment uh, using something at less uh, is, you know, is not going to be more damaging to the environment. Now, I've mentioned the difficulty of the application rate. You know, I've been through many times studying the labels, trying to figure out what the application rate is. And I find several of the products express the application rate as number of pounds per acre, which is not very helpful unless you've got a very large rose garden. Uh, so it's uh, once you find it, then you, I suggest that you muddle through and do find it. But then I think it's also useful to have a good spray reference to verify what you found and your calculation to be correct, and also to have a reference that you can thereafter use to go back to and determine what the label, what the application rate is. And so we included as one of the handouts the uh, spray, uh, the table that uh, Rose Mania publishes on a regular basis. This is based, uh, was updated in 2018. And I can tell you that I've looked at labels and in every case of their description of what the dosage per gallon is, is correct and is in compliance with what the label says. What I do on my own pesticides is when I do determine what the label is, I write what the application rate should be. I write it down on the label of the pesticide itself. So I don't have to dig through that six point type the next time and find the same answer to the question. So you can see here where I've written it down in a black uh, nursery pen. 
Uh, more recently, I, I bought this uh, brother's labeling machine, which I've been going crazy with, labeling roses, labeling everything I could find. And so I actually printed out a label on the label and put it on the pesticide here. You know, rather than do go through this little booklet, which is the label for that pesticide. You want to find out more about individual pesticides, you should be familiar with the National Pesticide Information Center, uh, which is a cooperative be between Oregon State University and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency that has, has everything. You can get uh, the labels, the MSDSs, and so on. And I've mentioned MSDS, that's a material safety data sheet. This is another source of information which is available on every pesticide that you have. Uh, it lists, there are like 16 things that are listed. Here's the first eight to give you an idea of the type of things that are listed on these. So if you wanted to learn more about a particular pesticide, get the MSDS and, and study it. Now, pesticides come with different modes of action. Uh, the contact chemicals uh, kill on contact. Systemic chemicals introduce toxins into the rows, which either kill or control when contact is made. And the systemic fungicides enter the leaves to prevent infection. Here, for example, systemic, uh, you know, it could come up through the roots or it could enter the, uh, basically the plant's vascular system. And the advantage of uh, systemics is they don't wash off when it rains. The downside is the systemics don't enter the blooms. And so, I mean, if you're really growing roses because you like the blooms like I am, systemics are not a very effective method of uh, providing uh, pesticide, not effective pesticides. Translaminar, here's a term you'll run into with uh, pesticides also. This means that it goes through the leaf to the underside of the leaf. This is useful, for example, uh, where you're dealing with spider mites, which typically feed on the underside of the leaves and are nearly uh, unaffected by systemics. Contact, uh, you know, there, there are various methods of contact, as you can see, direct contact uh, where uh, the chemical hits the pest, uh, secondary chemical where the pest crawls on it and picks it up from contacting the, uh, the leaf, ingested where the pest goes and chews on the leaf and dies from there. So these are all contact methods of chemicals. We need to mention pesticide resistance of, you know, pesticide resistance basically is saying that if you use the same pesticide over and over again, uh, you know, it'll kill some, you know, it'll kill a lot of the pests, but the resistant ones will survive. And uh, over time, what you'll wind up with is a population of resistant pests. So it is never a good idea to use pesticides over and over again. Uh, and rotating pesticides is important. Uh, there's a good deal of research been done in this area, and you'll find on pesticide labels, uh, for example, in fungicides are classified by groups. And so if you rotate among groups of pesticides or fungicides, you will have more effective uh, treatment of your pests, and you will avoid resistance. There's also a concept of secondary pest outbreaks that we need to be familiar with. Uh, most pesticides will kill the predators as well as the pests. And uh, one of the problems that we deal with here in California is that we have uh, spider mites and we also have chili thrips. And if we use an insecticide, uh, we use an insecticide uh, to kill the uh, chili thrips. It also kills the predators of the spider mites and we get a rebound infestation. This is, in fact, a photograph that Donna took of uh, our lavaglut in Arizona after I spent uh, several weeks spraying regularly right up before Rosho and it killed every insect in the garden, including anything that attacks spider mites, and I wound up with this uh, rebound or secondary pest outbreak. Let's talk about uh, the specific ways of controlling pests, uh, you know, um, beneficial insects. Uh, I'm not a big fan of beneficial insects. I know ladybugs eat aphids, and it's kind of cute to have these the ladybug releases, and the kids enjoy that and so on. But uh, I learned in kindergarten what ladybugs do. They, they fly away home because uh, their house is on fire, and their children are all going to burn. So uh, I'm not, uh, you know, I, I have yet to find that that is an effective method of, 
of control. Uh, I've experimented with sticky traps. Uh, this is uh, widely uh, promoted as a method of relatively non-toxic pest control. Uh, this is our garden in Arizona prior to a major road show where I put out 50 blue sticky traps in order to uh, attract thrips. And as you can see, I got one heck of a lot of thrips. I'm not sure that it made any difference in terms of uh, the controlling the thrips, uh, because what I think I did is I attracted them into the garden. I'm reminded uh, many of my friends in areas that have Japanese beetles uh, have told me that the best advice they can give with respect to Japanese beetle traps is to give them to your neighbors, you know, and let your neighbor and let the and let the Japanese beetles go over and attack the neighbors. Uh, uh, roses and uh, get tapped in their traps because sticky traps, it seems to me, more often than not, attract the pests to your yard. Here's an interesting concept. Uh, you know, the, any product intended for preventing or destroying a pest is considered under federal law to be a pesticide. Well, water is effective at preventing or destroying certain rose pests, so is water a pesticide? I'm not even sure I know the answer to that question, but I can tell you that it is probably the best pesticide that you can come up with. It is very effective in controlling spider mites, which is a problem that uh, we particularly have in the summer uh, here in California, and certainly in Arizona, I did. Uh, they also uh, are effective in controlling aphids. Uh, it's effective in controlling powdery mildew, uh, because powdery mildew is actually discouraged by water. It might even discourage thrips. Uh, so uh, water is absolutely one of the best things you can use for controlling. And I recommend this often to people who are, to, you know, for basically controlling pests. Here's a classic water one. Here's my friend, uh, again, um, Kent Campbell. Uh, I have this very same wand also, which was sold for years. Uh, I think the Cecil Stokes sold it for years before he, he retired and passed away. Uh, my current uh, use is uh, here. Here's something that uh, I, <laughs> I I thank uh, Suzanne Horn and uh, uh, Lou Pavlovich of uh, Tucson, Arizona, for getting me in, informed about this device. You will see a this is the Fogget nozzle, the heavy duty one. There's uh, these actually come in four different uh, uh, sizes, and this was the four gallon per minute, which is the heavy duty one. And this just creates this huge blast of water. You put it on the head of your water wand. You can see me uh, using it there on a rose. Uh, they describe it as like running your bush through a car wash. And for those who want to use water to control spider mites, I mean, this is this to me is a game changer and it's something that we're using a lot of. We, uh, I do want to mention as we're passing in terms of pesticides, uh, neonicotinoids, uh, they are a class of insecticides made to mimic nicotine, and I've mentioned nicotine sulfate, which is black flag. And so basically, uh, we've got these modern pesticides which imitate the effects of nicotine. They've been around since 1994, and by 1999, the neonicotinoid imidacloprid was the most widely used insecticide in the world. And it's something we encounter. That's Merit 75 WP is 75% imidacloprid, and it is um, uh, also found in uh, over-the-counter products like BioAdvance. BioAdvance, by the way, is the new word for Bayer, Bayer Advance. The Bayer home products were acquired by uh, um, a, a private company, and so they've changed the name to BioAdvance. Uh, I'm here at 1136, according to my clock, and I'm going to take just about a one-minute break, if I may. Uh, <laughs> I'm at the age where uh, the diet Dr. Pepper has made its way through me, so I'm going to give everybody a, a couple of minute bathroom break, and I'll be right back to continue this program. Honey, I need help stab. I'm just... Many of you might have questions. Uh, I've noticed some of these, uh, the questions uh, such as where do you find uh, about the classes of fungicides for rotation? We have another one there, what's the best color? 
Uh, what we're going to do at the end of Bob's presentation is there is a hand that you will be able to raise. And what I will do is unmute you because we can do that at the end of the presentation. And then we will say your name and let you ask that question to Bob uh, so everybody can hear uh, the answer to that question. So after he gets done with this presentation, don't worry, you're going to be able to ask all the questions that you want to ask. Uh, but look for that hand icon right there. Also, uh, we have had some questions about where do you find the handouts? And there's two different ways. If you can't find it within the GoToMeeting program, uh, that's okay. It is there. It's under handouts and you can download them. They're all PDFs. But the other place that we've just added recently on our website is on rose.org. Uh, if you go under resources, we have VR resources. And under that, you can see all these handouts along with uh, the previous chemical safety that we had promised to put up. Uh, we'll keep adding to that area. Uh, but I just wanted to let everybody know that you'll be able to ask questions. Uh, here in just a few minutes after the presentation is over with. I hope you're enjoying this program so far. All right, well, I'm back. Donna's telling me to stop avoiding moving back and forth in my chair. So if you're a presenter of one of these things, apparently the squeaking. And I will my chair before I do this again. Anyway, I was talking about the neonicotinoids, or neonics is what they're often called. And uh, to the Western honeybee, the aminoclopid is probably the most toxic insecticide ever created. And there's a lot of research that indicates a widespread agricultural use of neonics has contributed to the collapse of bee colonies worldwide. So many countries have restricted or banned the use of aminoclopid and other neonicotinoids. Um, the EPA's uh, approach to it has been to put a bee advisory box on your pesticides. And so you can take a look uh, at your pesticide to see whether or not it kills bees and it gives them instructions about, you know, basically the instructions says don't spray bees with it. Um, my own approach to it has been to try to, has been to avoid the neonics and to basically See, because you know, there's a lot of pesticides that you can use that uh, that are, are not anywhere near as destructive to bees as uh, neonics are. Here is uh, spinosad, which I mentioned in passing uh, previously, uh, conserve, which is 11.6%, and then Captain Jack's dead brew, uh, brew which is 0.5%, which is why as I mentioned, it's 17 times as strong, but both of these, uh, you know, this Spinosad has a very low uh, environmental impact quotient. Uh, basically, it's derived through the fermentation of a naturally occurring soil bacterium, so it's pretty much, uh, you know, it, it's nowhere near as toxic as other things that you can use. Here are some other low impact insecticides, such as Azimax. This is neem, a natural uh, broad spectrum neem based uh, anti feed and insect growth regulation. Uh, the pyrethrums, uh, striker is a good example of one. Uh, these are effective, uh, they actually combine two ingredients here, and one of them is and basically brings the insects out of the bloom and stirs them up, and the other one kills them. So uh, these are fairly low impact insecticides. Uh, there's the old standby orthene that we've used for years. Uh, the cyflethrin, which is tempo, is also, it's a pyrethroid insecticide, not a neonic, uh, which is effective. Um, my latest uh, go-to insect, I mean, the biggest problem we're dealing with, I've mentioned with, is chili thrips. I mean, chili thrips are, you know, there's 40% the size of a Western flower thrip and produce about three times the damage because they not only damage the heck out of the blooms, they, uh, they screw up the foliage as well. And uh, the most effective product that I have found for it is a product called Hachi Hachi. You have to look a bit to find this, and I'm not sure uh, if it's uh, restricted in any other states, but it is available in California, uh, and it is the most effective thing to come down a pike in a long time for uh, thrips. Uh, I also like Cyanora. 9.7, which uh, probably because I think that's the coolest name of any insecticide that I've seen so far. 
Miticides are also known as a caricide. Avid is a broad spectrum based one, bacteria base, uh, which is the low uh, rosy IQ that I described. Uh, so does tetrasan, and the newer one is Sultan, which uh, you can take a look at. Uh, Microbutanol has been around. This is Immunox. Uh, that actually has been, uh, I haven't checked lately, but in the past, it's uh, been American Rose Society endorsed brand. Uh, the spectroside brand has been of the same product uh, as a fungicide. The bio-advanced products, uh, by in general, you know, are actually pretty good products in my opinion. Um, they are relatively expensive for what you're dealing with, but if you have a small garden or you're advising somebody with a small garden, you know, who doesn't want to order a lifetime supply from one of the uh, online sources, uh, you can go and, and get, for example, their bio-advanced disease control as a nice fungicide for the control of black spot, powdery mildew. They claim to control rust, but I'm yet to be convinced that there's anything that can control rust other than getting warm. Organic home remedies. You know, here's a widely publicized recipe for powdery mildew you'll find all over the internet and that the various rose discussion groups like passing around uh, I've seen various formulations of this as a common one. You mix baking soda, dormant oil, with one teaspoon of insecticidal liquid soap to a gallon of water. You know, we don't recommend this. I mean, that you, what you're doing is you're mixing up your own pesticide. Now, pesticides got to have a label and be approved by the EPA, and I don't know that the EPA has ever approved anything. Uh, does this work? Well, yeah, a little bit. Uh, the reason it works is because uh, of the water. Uh, I mentioned uh, powdery mildew is uh, is discouraged by uh, free water, and so you know you go spray powdery mildew with your grandmother's perfume, and you're going to have an effect. Uh, so we, we you know, because only Rosarians, I just you know, you, I'm not in favor of recommending unlabeled pesticides or fungicides uh, that are supposedly organic home remedies. Uh, if you're going to pick one, uh, here's Green Cure, which is an 86% potassium bicarbonate. Uh, you know, th th that's something that is uh, that, that could be recommended if if somebody wanted to use a product generally thought to be organic. I mean, here's Serenade, for example, it's a biofungicide. This is the strain of Bacillus subtilis, which is a biological fungicide for the control and suppression of its label, for as you can see. Anthracnose, black spot, botrytis, downy mildew, powdery mildew. It's got an Omri label on it. You can buy this in the local, uh, you know, Home Depot. I've seen this everywhere, as a matter of fact. I've used it, and frankly, I've not been very impressed with how effective it is, but uh, it is at least fairly safe. Uh, here's one that Baldo uh, drew my attention to, which is Agrifos. Uh, it's just a systemic fungicide for the effective control of downy mildew, Phytophthora and Pythium, all of which are related. Uh, it's an over-the-counter fungicide. That's what OTC means. It's approved for use in organic gardening, and uh, you can find this at most local uh, garden centers as well for people dealing with uh, downy mildew. The strobiliarin chemistry, that's derived from a fungus that has a suppressive effect on other fungus. It's generally considered by the EPA to be a reduced risk pesticides. That includes Compass, Pageant, and Heritage. Uh, the Strobilians are brutally expensive, uh, but uh, very effective for the control of black spot, powdery mildew, and downy mildew. The old standby, Mancazeb, uh, which is widely used around the country against downy mildew and black spot and the waterborne fungus and fungus type diseases, um, marketed under various names. I don't. It, last I looked, we couldn't get this in California. It's basically a product that contains metallic ions. In this case, manganese. The CO means copper, and Z is the zinc ions. And uh, this is a long-term use for fungicides. I do want to comment about herbicides. Herbicides kill just not only herbs; they kill plants. And herbicides, as a general rule, sprayed in beds, damage or kill roses. It says on a Roundup label that you can use it around roses. Do not believe any such thing. Roundup should never be used around roses. In fact, in my opinion, Roundup shouldn't be used in the same county as your rose garden. 
I don't care how you apply this stuff, you will kill your roses with it. And it just should not be used in your rose garden. 24D, you run across this, you know, you've got a lawn, for those of us who have lawns, we don't have much of a lawn left. Uh, you know, you can buy a product that has got like weed be gone and the idea that it's gonna kill the weeds and crabgrass in your lawn without killing your lawn. Uh, you know, wonderful product, here's a product, you know, lawn weed and crabgrass killer. Well, how does it go about killing those weeds? It kills them by the roots and it kills roses. And you say, well, okay, if I just put them on my lawn, it shouldn't be. Well, guess where the roots of your roses are, or at least the roses that you have planted in beds next to your lawn, they're under your lawn. And so you should never use 2,4-D, uh, recommend the use of 2,4-D in any, anywhere near roses. Now, there are some exceptions. There's some things that can be recommended for as herbicides. The pre-emergence are ones that does preen or dimension 270G, uh, these prevent uh, seeds from germinating. So we are trying to prevent weeds. Since you're not growing your roses from seed, uh, you can use uh, such pre-emergent herbicides safely around roses. Uh, Fusilod is something that you may need to, you know, is desirable to know about. Malcolm Manners uh, introduced me to that particular herbicide. It is for the control of grass. It controls grass, like Bermuda grass. You get Bermuda grass in your rose beds, and you want to kill the Bermuda grass. It's tough ripping that stuff out of there. Fusilod, you can spray this stuff right over the top of roses, and it does not affect the roses. It just kills grass. It's very specific for grass. I want to talk a little bit about the tools of spraying. Uh, you need to buy a sprayer and recommend to anybody who asks about spraying that is adequate to your task because you know, an awful lot of the time you spend spraying is involved in mixing it and, uh, you know, how much spray do you need? You know, here's my rule of thumb that has worked well for years. Basically, on average, uh, about 24 full-size roses per gallon is uh, what you need as a sprayer. Uh, here's Satish Prabhu's 50-gallon sprayer. He's, he's recently moved, and I assume he took his sprayer with them. I've always been impressed with this this wonderful huge sprayer that he has. Uh, there are various kinds of sprayers. Uh, there's trigger, hose end, compression, battery powered. Uh, the, here, well, here's Baldo's sprayer. Actually not, but uh, Baldo sent me this picture once, so I love putting this in my program because here's our Baldo with a sprayer. The trigger sprayers are the ones basically like a Windex bottle. You can just squeeze it and, and you know, you, this this will work. You know, if you got somebody who's doing two or three roses and that's what is in their garden, they can use a trigger sprayer. Uh, in fact, some of these products are available in aerosol cans, so you can spray. But this is a very expensive way to go about it, and is too time-consuming for a large garden. Here are hose end sprayers. So you get a lot of spray, and you got a little dial with them that says you know, how many, how uh, much per gallon uh, is being sprayed. Uh, it's pretty crude. Uh, but you can, you know, I know some very serious rosaries, and this is what they use. You know, I mean, it's a blast, uh, you know, the, it's kind of tough to get the underside of the leaves with it. Uh, there's usually a little uh, baffle there on the end of the sprayer that you can turn around so it'll go up as opposed to going down. And that's this thing here. But um, this this pretty, you know, that, you know, as I say, you, you deliver a lot of spray material with that. More commonly, you have something like a compression sprayer where you want to pump something up. Uh, these you can get in metal or plastic. Don't get metal compression sprayers. They will bend. They will become dented. They will corrode. They do not last. Better to have a good, strong plastic sprayer. Uh, here are compression sprayers that you can carry on your back. A problem with carrying stuff on your back, you know, um, water is really heavy. And uh, two to three gallons is about the most you can carry in your back. And if you get to be an old guy like me, you know, I don't like trotting around with two or three gallons of water on my back, but uh, quite a few people still use the backpack sprayer. This is the product that I use, which is a spot shot. Uh, it's an electric sprayer. The problem with this is that the product, uh, is, I got it from Rosemania, and right now it's, uh, they don't have it. Uh, apparently there's a problem with the manufacturer and, you know, and it's just been an ongoing problem for rose exhibitors to find a sprayer of a capacity of seven to 12 gallons. 
that is an effective sprayer. And frankly, I don't even have a recommendation at this point as to how to find one. I did a survey of exhibitors years ago, which I determined, you know, what they're using as sprayers. I found out that more than half of them kind of jerry rigged their own sprayer uh, because there really isn't a product on the market. Uh, I do, if you do have a battery sprayers, I do want to tell you, you know, you know, if you have the spot shot, for example, from Rosemania, don't buy their battery replacement because it's extremely expensive. Uh, the batteries have, you know, batteries have a life. And uh, I, I discovered Battery Mart, this is the cheapest place on the net that you can get replacement batteries for. Um, I don't like the typical length of a of a hose that comes with sprayers. Rosemania sells those with a 50 foot hose and that is good. Uh, that's the one I've got on my sprayer so I can park it at one spot in the yard and go 50 feet in either direction to spray roses before having to move it again. Uh, you need a spray gun that will lock, you know, something that you've just got to hold on to like that. Your hand gets tired real fast. So you need a spray gun that will lock in an open position. Uh, first thing I do whenever I get a sprayer is I get a new nozzle. I uh, order from, you know, I get one of these uh, brass nozzles that uh, will unscrew easily to remove obstructions. I have a paper clip that's attached to my sprayer straps uh, that also is just there for that purpose so I can poke out obstructions that invariably wind up in the no in nozzle of my sprayer. Now, understanding pesticide safety, we need to understand how your pesticides enter your body. Here's an interesting chart where it shows the various ways pesticides can enter the body oral, that is you're eating or smoking while mixing or during and after spraying. Dermal is the most common cause of pesticide poisoning. You get it through the skin. Uh, there's inhalation where you're breathing it and then some of it you get in your eyes. Here in terms of dermal, this is the relative absorption rates as compared to the forearm. So we say that the forearm is one. And you can see the palm is 1.3 and the abdomen's here, the forehead, the scalp, the genital area, the ball of the foot. So uh, these are the areas you know, that you want to protect when you spray. I pulled this advertisement, I think it's an advertisement for a Hudson sprayer, and this is just astonishing advertisement for me. Because I cannot, I mean, I've been counting, count the number of things where, things that is wrong with this picture. You know, we can start with the proposition that skin contact with concentrated materials is dangerous when you're handling pesticides. So here we have this woman who's ostensibly spraying with this little bitty sprayer. She has no gloves. She's got bare arms. She has no eye protection. She has no face protection. She got a straw hat on. I can't see what her feet are doing, but I bet she's got sandals on here. And this is a perfect example of how not to spray. You'll notice she has a wonderful smile, and that's because, as I figure, that she's brain dead. Uh, that's going to be the only explanation of why she's smiling in that picture. Now, here's me uh, dressed up for spraying. And as you can see, I am wearing a long sleeve shirt and pants. I have my eyes protected with splash resistant goggles. I have chemical resistant gloves. I have chemical resistant boots. And I'm wearing a cap, which is my standard spray cap, which is a Cleveland Indians baseball cap, uh, which is the team that I root for. So that's how I dress up. You'll notice, just to expand further on that, Notice also I'm carrying my hand. Let me back that picture up again. See this thing here? That's my spray wand. And that is a spray wand that is a 48 inch extension of the spray wand. I have found over the years the best way to keep the spray away from your body is to spray far away from your body. And so 48 inch spray wand I'm now standing four feet away from the rose when I'm spraying it. And I have found this extremely useful and have done this for years with this extension on my spray wand. I wear chemical splash goggles since you notice I'm wearing glasses, so I need something that will go over my glasses. I want one that has an anti-fog so it doesn't fog up. I want one that has indirect venting. That's what these things are so that the splash of the chemicals doesn't get into them. 
and I like one with a clear lens. So here, in fact, is the product that I use, uh, which is a protective chemical splash goggles. I use disposable nitrile gloves. Don't use your regular gloves. You use leather gloves out there, and the leather, the chemicals get in your gloves. So you want to handle it with a chemical resistant gloves. And these are the ones uh, I, for years, kept telling Robbie that the ones, uh, Robbie Tucker, that the ones they were selling, they were selling two milliliter uh, thick nitrile disposable gloves, which tear. You know, I talked them into going to the eight is what they sell now. You want something that's this thick so that they don't tear. Uh, but the whole point, too, is that these are disposable. So when you're done spraying, you throw these away and uh, use fresh ones the next time. Uh, I'm a fan of the Wellington boot because, uh, you know, I love the pictures of the guys in their English gardens walking around in these boots. Uh, this is the Wellington boot, but the advantage here is a rubber boot. Uh, which for spraying is useful. Um, just as a little side here, if you're using a rubber boot, uh, I found that if you get a PVC boot jack, you can actually get the things back off your feet uh, as opposed to the ones that I was using before. Now, you notice in the picture that I'm not wearing Tyvek coveralls and I'm not wearing a full face respirator. Here's, here's my good friend, John Moe, dressed up in the full gear with the Tyvek coveralls and a full face respirator. And I've been asked, and I've given this program before, well, gee, Bob, why are you not wearing a full face respirator and Tyvek coveralls? And I'm not wearing Tyvek coveralls because I got the other protective clothing on uh, and because I think, frankly, they look stupid. But that's, I'm sorry, John, I'm, I think uh, you're probably here today. So, yeah, you dress up and those things, you look kind of foolish. But I have to, what about a, a respirator? You know, so the question here is, what's the message? Here's Kitty Belendez uh, at a CR seminar showing up with her outfit to spray with, you know, which I still laugh at when I look at the picture. And so when I'm asked why I don't use a respirator, I said, well, listen, I'm already, I'm using chemicals that almost every one of them has a caution label. You know, I've already described all the other protective stuff that I've gone through. And, uh, you know, what additional protection am I really getting from the respirator versus what is the message? I have neighbors, you know, and my neighbors have dogs and cats and kids, you know, and so I'm going to go out there, you know, in my garden Sunday morning or Sunday afternoon after church, dressed up like I'm going on a moonwalk. And what is the message that I have delivered is that I'm spraying God knows what. I'm spraying dangerous stuff all over my yard, right next to their house that could be affecting their cats and their kids. And I'm delivering a message that roses really are very, very hard to grow. And I just don't want to deliver that message because I don't think those messages are true. So that's why I don't wear a respirator. Make up your own mind about whether you want to wear one. When to spray, you need an orderly spray schedule. I've already mentioned way back at the beginning of this program about preventive, uh, how prevention, particularly with fungicide, a two-week schedule is pretty typical. Uh, you don't want to spray in windy conditions. It's kind of obvious. You do not want to spray in high heat. You'd like to tie, allow time for the spray to dry. So the best time for spraying is in the early morning so that it can dry during the day. Of course, you know, I tell people do not spray in windy conditions, but I can guarantee you just as soon as you put seven gallons worth of pesticide into your and walk out in your garden, it could be a perfectly still day and the wind will start to blow. Uh, it just, the pervasive, you know, the, it, it just will happen. So you learn to spray so you're going downwind. But before you load up your, you know, here's, 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 here's an extremely important point. I have seen and talk to consulting Rosarians and others. And what they do is they mix their chemicals and then they put on their protective gear. The time you need your protective gear is when you're mixing the chemicals because you're dealing with a concentrated form of the chemical. And so put on your protective gear. And if you were going to wear a respirator, here's an opportunity, here's a time when it would be a good idea to wear one is when you're, in fact, uh, mixing your chemicals as opposed to uh before you know doing it afterwards uh it's useful to have some measuring cups you know most of your nurseries have little these little graduated plastic cups 
which don't work very well because you know the markings get obscured pretty fast. I have a set of plastic measuring spoon and cups which are dedicated. Don't you know, guys out there, don't use your wives' cooking materials for this. Uh, get your own. Uh, Rosemania sells some really cool stainless steel measuring spoons. They actually have two different sets. Uh, one's a regular size, and that's like a tablespoon. And then I got these odd sizes. And this is what's going to happen with, you know, if you've got a seven gallon tank like I do, and you calculate, you know, it's one tablespoon per gallon. I mean, you know, it's one quarter of a tablespoon per gallon. You're going to wind up in seven gallons having seven fourths of a one and three quarters tablespoon. You know, I mean, you've got to get these oddball sizes. So that's what's really cool. This thing's got a bunch of oddball sizes. This one here for uh, you, you non-cooks is actually called a pinch. You know, I've heard of a pinch of something, and you know, I've never run across a, a pesticide label that says that you apply a pinch of it, but that's that's a pinch there. Um, adjuvants, uh, the term adjuvant is basically a chemical that modifies the effect of other chemicals. It comes from the word to add. Uh, spreader sticker is an adjuvant that breaks the water tension and permits the spreading and adhesion of the spray material of the plant. It's also used to acidify alkaline water. A widely recommended adjuvant is soap, soap, uh, dish soap. Dish soap is used for washing dishes. If you're going to use an adjuvant, get something that is intended for that purpose rather than something you're just winging it with your dish soap. Uh, pH, uh, you'll get more of this in discussion on fertilizers when that comes along, but uh, the degree of acidity of uh, water or anything is measured by pH. 7 is neutral. It runs from 0 to 14. The significance here in terms of pesticides is that the effectiveness of pesticides affected by the pH of your water. And if you got alkaline water like we do here on the West Coast, you, you need to adjust the pH of it in order to make your pesticides most effective. And in general, they are most effective of a pH of at about five, which is why indicate five is in fact the most widely used adjuvant in my surveys of exhibitors, uh, because basically it's got a dye in it that turns the water pink when the pH is at five. And it's also got an excellent spreader sticker. On the downside, it's got a danger label on it, and it can no longer be shipped to California. So uh, the alternative recommendation is Branch Super 7, which also has the acidifying agent and a spreader sticker, but not the pink dye. And it comes with a warning label instead of a danger label. I do need to warn you, uh, do not make a stupid mistake that I made when I first got Branch Super 7. Uh, because I just assumed that if Brand Super 7 was a replacement for Indicate 5, that it would be applied at the same rate as Indicate 5. And I'd stop, you know, Indicate 5, you apply it until the water turns pink, and over years I determined exactly, you know, I could just splash it right in there. And so I would, I splashed in Super 7 without bothering to read the label and learned later that uh, it's like, four times as concentrated as indicate five. And so I was putting it on at four times the recommended. And this is what I got. For those of you unfamiliar with what happens when you get phytotoxicity, uh, yeah, I, I did that with branch seven to quite a few roses uh, because I didn't bother to read the label. There's another example of it. Uh, so there are others, uh, for example, the metallic fungicides, mancus have aliet, which is aluminum base, is highly acidic. So putting a, something to acidify something that's already acidic it will give you this phytotoxicity. So when you're using adjuvants, you need to be careful about exactly what they're doing. Phytotoxicity is, in fact, a toxic effect by a chemical on plant growth, such as pesticides, herbicides. You know, this is what you get when you spray Roundup somewhere around your roses. Even if you're spraying something like a fungicide and a mycorrhizae are beneficial fungi that establish symbiotic relationships with roots and are usually very helpful in growing roses, well, fungicides can kill the mycorrhizal fungi because it's a fungicide. And so you need to know that uh, if you're dealing with mycorrhizae. Preparing to spray, uh, you should learn to agitate your tank to mix the chemicals, pump up compression sprayers, 
prime the hose and nozzles. You know, a lot of people don't realize you need to do that with an electric sprayer. Stick the sprayer head down into the tank and let it prime so that you get all the bubbles out and you get a nice effective spray nozzle effect. That's what the cone should be. And that's why I use those brass nozzles. And you keep the nozzle free from obstruction. You spray down wind because as I mentioned, the wind's going to come up just as soon as you've mixed up a batch. Uh, it's not like hunting lions or something. You don't have to stay upwind of them. You know, you can come downwind. It's not that the pests are going to know you're coming. Or even if they do, it's too bad. Uh, spray the underside and the tops of the leaves. And so you do it in two passes. I start on the underside and then come down over the top. Uh, Rambling Rosaria and Howard Walters always says you spray to the point of glistening. And I, that word stuck in my mind and is actually a pretty good word. That's point of spray. Uh, finishing up, you want to empty the tank. Uh, here is where I finish emptying my tank. This is Madame Alfred Carrier, uh, which is one of the many climbers, 13 climbers we have on the back fence. As you can see, it's a monster. And so they, that's a great place to finish up your spraying and finish emptying your tank is to unload the rest of it on Madame Alfred Carrier. But you don't want to dump this stuff. You don't dump your pesticides into gutters or storm drains. Here, everything drains to the sea. And we don't want to do that. So empty your tank when you're finishing up. And after you spray, clean your equipment. Don't do it in a location where your rich water flows into your gutters or your storm drains or your sewers. Uh, you could use kitty litter, sawdust, or other absorbent cleaning compounds to clean up a spilled pesticide. After you spray, you know, I put this little thing here, try a little harder to be a little better because, you know, we give this kind of advice and we try to take it ourselves. And, you know, and I, I get sloppy about this. This is probably where we all get sloppy, but we need to do this. We need to rinse our measuring cups and spoons. We need to tighten our bottle caps. We need to store our chemicals safely. We need to flush out the sprayer after we spray. We need to clean those goggles that you've got. I, uh, this, I've used this product in the past, the Vision Aid little foil things, but I actually I found at uh, Costco that they have these lens wipes. And so I got a box of them sitting in the garage. First thing I do is I clean my goggles. I got to clean my glasses on off of. Wash off those chemical resistant boots. Wash your hands. Wash your clothes. Take a shower. Be like the bird there after you spray. Chemicals need to be stored in their original containers with the label. Do not ever divide chemicals and place them into small containers. You know, I borrowed this from a Steve Jones presentation years ago. He found this in somebody's garage. Oh boy, you know, somebody's taking rally and just put rally on there. Here they're trying a little harder by writing down at least what the amount is or what it's for. Don't do that. You know, you don't split chemicals among friends. You don't store leftover mixed chemicals. That's why you've emptied your tanks. You know, you don't leave it in the tank after the fact. And then you lock it away. You lock it away from children. You put it in a cool, dark area. Recognize, you know, pesticides don't become unstable over time, but they can lose their effectiveness. You know, interesting, I remember years ago, we had a presentation from a chemical manufacturer. Somebody asked him the question, you know, how long does this stuff last? You know, how come it's not like date stamped? I mean, you get milk and it says it's best if used by thus and such. Pesticide labels don't have that. He says, well, they don't really know. They haven't done that kind of research on them. Uh, you know, they don't want to put it on the label unless they can, they can't put it on the label unless they can demonstrate it. And they really don't want to tell you because this stuff like lasts forever. Uh, you know, that's that's pretty much what he said. Uh, I don't know how forever is, but uh, I can assure you that most of the chemicals you lose are going to last a long time. But when you run out, you got empty containers, triple rinse your empty containers. Never reuse a pesticide container for any purpose. You can throw them in the trash, but only if they are completely empty. I actually put them in with the recyclables because I look at the bottom of my labels of the containers and they usually have that little diagram at the bottom that says that it's recyclable so i put them into the uh recyclable waste but do 
properly dispose of chemicals. But let's suppose you do have chemicals. You know, there's some of us have been around, I've been growing roses for 48 years. I don't have a whole lot of old chemicals around, but I mean, let's say you got old chemicals and something that, you know, you're not sure it works anymore, or maybe it's been uh, you know, something you just don't want to use anymore. Uh, it's hazardous waste, guys. And, uh, you know, typically uh, your community will have periodically these hazardous waste collection days, you know, where you get rid of your old paint. I mean, I, you know, gosh, a number of people I've run into say, well, gee, I don't want to use chemicals in my house. And I just say, well, why don't you look at what's under your sink? You know, and you see some of the crazy chemicals that we use for our drains or for cleaning or whatever. And pesticides are the same. They are hazardous waste. And so if you've got any pesticide chemicals, don't just throw these in your trash. They're hazardous waste and take them to the hazardous waste disposal area. You know, I've wondered about that. If poison expires, is it no longer poisonous? Hmm. Well, I'll let you all think about that. But that's uh, the end of my presentation. And that's what the back of our garden often looks like uh, sprayed, I might add, because we, in fact, do spray.